now I realize it's just, you know, what, like everyone, you know, everyone feels weird and out of place, you know, to some extent, everyone has imposter syndrome to some extent, you know, so if I could go back in time, I would tell my younger self, like, it's cool to feel that way. That's fine. But you're okay. You're going to be okay. Um, just be your, yourself, your, your weird, nerdy self. That's, that's going to be your, your main asset, you know, later on. So just roll with it. Um, yeah. And then I probably would have freaked out because younger me would be like, what? Who are you? And, and <laughs> why are you we'll talking to me? Away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you're watching on YouTube, please like, subscribe, and leave a comment about the episode. And if you're watching on Spotify or listening on a traditional podcast platform, please follow, rate us five stars, and leave a review if you would be so kind. Thank you. Welcome to the Way to Know You podcast, season two, episode 17. My name is Nick Rounds, and I will be your host. My next guest has dedicated their life to creating virtual games with tangible, real-life benefits. From in-game charity events benefiting nonprofits to teaching high school kids about game design, to creating horror games that help players manage anxiety and phobias. She's stretching the definition of what good game means. She's an award-winning game designer and the founder slash creative director of Flying Mollusk, makers of the game Nevermind. She's given TED Talks, run multiple successful crowdfunding campaigns, and received awards at the White House for her innovative designs. These days, she's working for the House of Mouse, aka Disney, where she probably can't talk about anything she's working on. <laughs> for at least two years, uh, and when she's not busy respecting ironclad non-disclosure agreements, she's hoarding tea packets and petting cats. Erin Reynolds, wait, I know you. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you. That was an excellent introduction. Thank you, Nick. How are you doing? <laughs> I, am, I am well. Thank you for asking. Um, and it's all true, especially the tea packet hoarding. I have a whole closet <laughs> dedicated to tea packets. And a whole another closet dedicated to cats, but I can't talk about that because it creeps people out. So it's a it's a crazy cat lady starter pack, but yeah, you're 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 beating me because you have one more cat than I do. So That's true. <laughs> it's all good. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, it's I've been on a streak of interviewing fellow game designers or people I've worked with that have done amazing things. Um, full disclosure: you and I used to work at Zynga, we're old coworkers, um, but we we've, we've kept in touch ever since. Um, but, uh, my, my favorite and of course ghost wants to say hello as well. Um, Oh, Hey ghost. <laughs> um, so before we kick into your professional career ghost, come on, I'm talking. I know. Hold on. He, he knows you have a cat lady on. So, you know, yeah, he's got He's, he's got to say hello. <laughs> All right. Um, so before we kick into your professional career, I think it's important to highlight how you became a video game nerd. Uh, and I say that in the most lovingly way possible. Of course, there's no uh, other way to say it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, a nerd. Um, so everyone in the games industry has had games that they hold dear to their heart and inspire them to join the industry. What were some of those games for you? Oh, man. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, I mean, there's so many games that I hold near and dear to my heart that it's it's I can spend the entire you know an hour plus listing all the ones that that have influenced and inspired me in, in some way. Um, you know, I, I I I know I've talked about like you know my TED talk. I talk about how you know Echo the Dolphin really had a big impact on me, and uh, Dance Dance Revolution really had a big impact on me, especially as I started to really think about how can games positively impact people and inspire people um, like. Dance Dance Revolution and Echo the Dolphin inspired me. Um, but you know, I think they're like thinking about games that that inspired me to get into the industry. Um, you know, I, uh, I I have a real soft spot in my heart for um, the legacy of Kane games, um, especially Soul Reaver. Um, I remember um, one of the like special features, you know, in the in the menu, the start menu, was to see the dev team behind Soul Reaver, and like seeing that image really was like, oh man, that's that looks like a really cool team, you know, and 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 that's what got me thinking along the lines of 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 uh, um, kind of going in this field. Uh, now, granted, I I do need to qualify that I actually, for some reason, did not put two and two uh, together about actually working in the game industry until like 
at the end of my undergraduate career. I actually started out wanting to um, go into 3D animation um, because, you know, I saw I saw the, like the Soul Reaver like folks and, and, and Toy Story was like coming out. And I was it, I, I sort of triangulated that to think that like, oh, man, 3D animation is, is exactly like how I want to combine my like nerdy love of computer graphics and, and art and, and, and design. And so that's actually what I started pursuing. Uh, and, and it was what brought me out here to Los Angeles, um, originally to go to the University of Southern California, where they had this great animation program that I did not get into, but I went to their fine arts uh, school and, uh, and took, um, you know, an animation class to kind of get that knowledge anyway. Um, and uh, sorry, I'm going on a total tangent here, uh, but- uh, No, you're good, keep going. Okay, okay, good. Um, so, uh, you know, so I, I took an animation class and, and realized I was terrible at animation, just like, not like, you know, I'm just starting out. I just need to work at it and I'll get better. We're all terrible when we first start. So it was just like, this is not for me. And I didn't enjoy it. You know, I didn't, I, I saw that like, this was not the perfect fit for me that I thought it was. So, um, uh, yet it still did not occur to me that video games is, is kind of where my destiny would take me. I, I instead of pivoted instead pivoted to visual effects, um, thinking, okay, this is also a great combination of my love for um, storytelling and, and computer graphics and, and art and technology and all of that. And so um, I actually became part of the uh, school special effects association um, because uh, you know I'm a nerd like that and, and learned a lot about it through that student club uh, because there really weren't any official classes um, on, in that area. Um, and one thing that this this group special SEFX um, uh, would do is uh, for spring break they would bring organize a trip for all the members of the organization to um, go up to San Francisco and visit special effects houses. So we'd go to places like Tip Studios and um, uh, gosh, there's so many that I'm not totally spacing on them. But you know, um, uh, I think ILM one year um, I didn't get to go to ILM when I was Part of the group, but you know, a lot of those great classic uh, visual effects and practical effects houses. Um, sure. and, and one of the years that I went, we thought, well, hey, we're up here. Why don't we visit Electronic Arts? Because um, you know, video games are kind of close to visual effects. Um, and so we went. And I remember while we were there. And first of all, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, like it's EA. This is this is amazing. They make The Sims and all these other games that I love and, <laughs> and you know, have worshipped growing up. Um, and, and they brought us to this auditorium and someone there, and I really wish I could remember who it was, um, but some EA employee gave this presentation on the difference of, between working in visual effects and, and working in video games. And that's when it like clicked, like, why didn't I not think of this at any point before? Of course, video games, it combines everything that I love, you know, storytelling, technology, art, um, world building, and video games, which I've always loved, like since I was like, Five. Um, and so that's when it really just like all came together finally where like, okay, that's video games is, is definitely the path I want to go on. And so the rest is history. So that's a very long answer. To <laughs> <laughs> I started. Um, the what, uh, to it. No, it's all good. Um, what year did you visit the, uh, the electronic arts campus? Oh my gosh. Uh, I want to say 2004. 2003 maybe 2000 yeah 2003 2004 okay. not to date it, myself too much but. <laughs> well i was going to date myself by saying i might have been working there when you visited but that was a little bit before my time but yeah 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 the the electric the ea redwood campus uh is a impressive campus for sure Beautiful. um it's it's for context that people are listening um Electronic Arts, the Redwood, Redwood City campus is right next to like Oracle and some other huge campuses um, in that general area. Um, it's, uh, I guess you could still count it as Silicon Valley, even though it's really just like Foster City, San Mateo, like Redwood City area. Um, but yeah, there's there's so many huge companies on that on that side, on the peninsula. So. Um, <laughs> Ghost is just gonna keep saying hi the entire time. Apparently, so anytime I mute myself, he's gotta he's gotta say hello. Um, um, so I want to go back to because I know that you kind of brush over the fact that like um, you touched on a lot of the things in your TED talk, the games that inspired you, 
you touched on echo the dolphin um but i'm curious like what are are there some common through lines there of those games that like really inspired you or like really um kind of lay the groundwork of like what really excites you or motivates you about creating games or, or playing or working on games in general yeah i mean for me one of the most exciting things about playing and you know hands-on creating a game is, is really building a, a world an experience that people can lose themselves into and, and um, kind of test different boundaries in, in a safe place, you know? And so whether you're, you know, exploring a, a, a world that could never exist in real life, you know, the trees are pink and you're flying or whatever the case may be, you know, um, you know, that's just, that's just fun and cool, you know, and, and it also gives you an opportunity to, to try things and, and try and fail without really any consequence, you know? And, and I think that's for me, what's, can be so powerful about how video games can have a positive impact because it, it creates this inviting, engaging experience that people want to engage in. You know, people are excited and motivated and, and um, drawn into. Um, and then you kind of create this 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 area where they can, um, yeah, just test their own boundaries, whether it's their own courage, whether it's their own. Um, uh, you know, grappling with moral issues. You know, there's a lot of narrative games that really place players in very interesting moral dilemmas and, and they can make choices uh, that, you know, would be horrific to have to make in real life with real consequences, but really interesting and, and getting to think philosophically, you know, sure. and, and so there's this fictional safe game context, you know. And so what a great way to learn, you know, because we learn so much from our mistakes, you know, and, and um, you can make mistakes, you can try new things, you can be someone you're not, um, be in someone else's shoes, you know, in, in the game context, in the way that um, you, you can in other media, you know, you can read a book and, and have sort of that similar, <laughs> it goes, <laughs> similar <laughs> experience, um, or watch a movie certainly, or, or anything like that, but with games, you know, you, you really, you have that agency of being able to, to actually make the choice and actually, um, you know, drive the direction of what's happening in, in, the, in the obviously interactive way. And so I think that's just infinitely fascinating to, to me again, like as a player and, and also um, as, a, as a game uh, or as a yeah, game maker. Do you have any favorite moral uh, decisions that you've had to make in a game that kind of like really stick with you? Oh, that's a good question. I don't, I mean, yes. I mean, I'm sure I'm trying to think of one that's like, Nothing's coming off the top of my head, but that doesn't mean that there aren't any. I've just, I've, <laughs> I've, I've like locked that well, away, you know? <laughs> well, the, yeah, well, let me, yeah. let me walk that back. I mean, yeah. maybe not a moral decision, but maybe sure. a time where a game has made you do something that's really affected you so much in a way that you're like, wow, I can't believe they stuck that in the game and that it got that emotional response out of me. Oh, gosh. Uh, man. Yes. But I need to give that some thought because again, like there's cobwebs on that, and I probably repressed <laughs> memories of things that games have had to like make me do that sure. um, I don't, I don't like. Well, you know, like I, one one thing generally speaking is like when you have a game where you have to hunt and kill an animal. Like I love animals, and 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 um, I really, really, really hate it when a game makes me kill, you know, something else, and and. Um, but, you know, there's games where you have to, you know, you have to defend yourself, you have to for resources and survival, right? And, and so that's a really, that's an interesting dilemma that, like, I know it's a game. I know that, like, you know, all the components that, that went into making it, and, like, obviously I'm not killing something. It's a 3D model that a bunch of artists work really hard on, and programmers work really hard to, like, and, and game designers, like, you know, we're in meetings for hours upon hours to design this one moment to make me feel very uncomfortable and they're very successful. Um, and so even knowing how the sausage is made, it still really impacts me, you know, and, and, um, and I'm grateful that I'm wrestling with that decision in a virtual world where again, the consequences are, you know, no, nothing's dying. Um, and, and not in real life where, where I, you know, if I were faced in that situation, I probably would have to make the same decision, you know, and, and, um, so it's interesting to kind of grapple with that, you know, virtually before. Hopefully I'll never have to do that in real life, but, you know, yeah. 
for sure. Um, yeah, I I didn't want to like seed any answers because I because uh, one of the reason one of the reasons I knew you and I were going to hit it off early is when I was first talking to you about games in general. Like two other games that came out of your mouth first were Katamari, oh yeah, and uh, Eternal Darkness. Yes, um, and then later I go to Dolphin, of course, and then um, but I was impressed that you knew Katamari Damacy and that you knew Eternal Darkness because a lot of people Eternal Darkness if you didn't own a GameCube it might be a deep cut for most people. Um, but yeah, what did you like most about that game? Eternal Darkness? Yeah. Or, or uh, well, yeah. So well, both, I guess. <laughs> I mean, they're so similar. You know, you talk about one, you're basically <laughs> talking about the other one. <laughs> so, it's practically in the same universe. What are you talking about? I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, well, for Eternal Darkness, I mean, it's, I, gosh, I love so many things about that game. Um, you know, the, the insanity meter, especially how it breaks the fourth wall, how it, it, really creates these very unexpected moments. Um, for, for those who haven't played it, there's there's this, um, you have your health meter, you know, so it's an adventure game, basically. Um, so you have your health meter, as you usually do, um, but you also have an insanity meter. And so anytime you go into a situation that's really weird, if you walk into a room that has a bunch of disturbing stuff in it, um, or you have a, a, you know, you encounter creatures, which are all disturbing, it's very Lovecraftian. Like, if, if you're familiar with Bloodborne, it's kind of like, Bloodborne for GameCube in, in a sense, different gameplay style, but sort of going for that sort of aesthetic. Sure. Um, uh, and so as your insanity meter drained, more and more weird things would happen. And with the conceit that, um, you know, the, the player character is, is, is losing their sanity, you know, they're starting to hallucinate. So you have moments where like, um, yeah, talk talk about a moment that a game really impacted me. There's a moment where, um, if you're in spoilers, I guess for anyone who hasn't played it but still is planning to, um, if the sanity meter drops too low, um, the game will it'll look like it restarts, um, just kind of blips, and you're like, oh, that's you know weird, um, and it, it goes back to the start screen. And you go like, okay, I'll just load up where I last saved, and all your save data is gone, and like you know this can happen pretty late in the game, and you're just like what, you know, freaking out because it's like, I just, I have so many hours invested in this and all my save data is gone. I don't even know what happened. You know, you're about ready to like start crying. And then like the game just like, whoop, whoop, and goes back to where you left off in the game. It's just the whole game like messing with you, you know, and um, which is pretty cool. Uh, mean, but cool. Um, <laughs> you know, or things where like your character will be walking and their head just, I think, like falls off and rolls on the ground. You're like, what? You know, and so there are tons of these moments that were just really bizarre. And, um, uh, so that was really fun. And, and, you know, it's what's cool about Eternal Dark is also is that you play as lots of different types of characters throughout. And uh, some of the characters that you play as um, uh, survive and some of them, they, they die at the end, you know, and, and that's what happens. And, and so that's a very unexpected and, and cool. So they just did a lot of really different, interesting things with it um, that uh, I really enjoyed. Um, and then Katamari, I mean, similarly, they did also a lot of very different, unexpected things as well. You know, a lot of these elements of surprises, and, but it's much more, it's a cute game and, and very different aesthetic. Um, and what I loved about Katamari is just this game that you can't help but feel so much joy when you're playing it. You know, it's just, it's just delightful in every aspect. Um, and actually going back to kind of my career path, you know, when I decided to transition from visual effects to video game development, I actually wanted to be a concept artist. Um, but it wasn't until I went to a GDC and I heard Keita Takahashi, who is the creator of Katamari Dynasty, um, talk about game design, that that's when things clicked for me that game design is really where I wanted to, to head, you know? And so it was really, that game inspired me in a big way um, and, and Ken Takahashi specifically to to um, think about making games from a game design standpoint. You had made it, before you came to Zing, you worked, you worked in a game called Nevermind in college, which was your college thesis, is that correct? Yeah, my master's thesis. Master's thesis. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one thing that was like really, it was interesting to know you around that time because mm -hmm. There is a nine <laughs> at you in terms of knowing that you had this awesome game idea that you wanted to see to fruition and to like see a more fulfilled version of it. But you also were kind of trying to launch yourself into back in the games industry and like 
work the old desk job as it were <laughs> for the corporate overlords. And I say that lovingly, of course, uh, don't sue me. Um, <laughs> but, um, uh, but it was interesting to know you around that time because I, I knew you around the time that Nevermind wasn't seen to its full potential. And now of course you have seen it to its full potential. It's released on steam and everything. Um, but after you, so you left Singa and you went back to found your own indie studio called Flying Mollusk um, to go build out the full version of Nevermind. Um, can you give the audience that's listening what the elevator pitch of what Nevermind is, which of course is a is a whole thing, but yeah. go for it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I guess the elevator pitch for Nevermind is it's a uh, biofeedback enhanced adventure thriller game. Um, so, so the idea is that, you know, it's, it's, it's this really dark, intense game. Um, you know, it, it's a horror game in many ways, um, but more like mystery horror, not like zombies running at you in machete horror. Um, and, and if you play it, you know, you, you, the narrative, I'll step back. The narrative is that you're playing as what's called a neuroprogrammer, which is this like psychologist of the not too distant future who works with um, clients, with patients who have experienced um, a psychological tra traumatic event. Hey, there's a trailer. Um, at some point, um, <clears throat> you know, in their life, and, and traditional therapeutic means have not been uh, fruitful for them. And so, um, this neuroprober will work with them to actually go inside their subconscious mind to try to to figure out what the trauma was, because these people have have also repressed the memory of of the traumatic experience. It was so intense that it just the subconscious mind couldn't deal with it anymore. And this is something that actually can happen um, in, in cases where some people have experienced trauma in real life. Um, and so, you know, each level is a different, um, uh, you know, traumatic story. And so as you're playing, you're, you're you know, exploring these, these almost dream scapes and trying to figure out what traumatic event happened and there's clues and everything. And of course it's, it's very uh, intense and, and, and um, you know, in many cases creepy um, because of the, the dark nature of the um, uh, storytelling of each level. And so they're forced to, to go through these very intense, uncomfortable moments and situations. And if you play it with um, one of the heart rate sensors um, uh, or even have a motion sensor that I can talk about um, that the game supports, um, the game can actually detect when you're starting to get scared and stressed. Um, and it becomes harder as you get more stressed. So you really have to learn how to stay calm while you're playing it and recognize when you're starting to feel anxiety and um you know trepidation as you're heading into these intense situations um and so you know the the idea is um that by playing never mind um if you play with you know with the biofeedback feature and you can play it without it and then it's just more of a traditional uh mystery thriller game but if you do play it um with the biofeedback enabled then it becomes sort of like a stress management tool uh, disguised as a video game uh, where, you know, by becoming more aware of those internal signals within yourself or when you're getting stressed or when you're getting um, anxious, you're able to, you know, you, you learn you have to take a, a deep breath or calm down or, 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 you know, recognize that while you're playing the game. Otherwise, you're not going to get too far. And that's almost trading you for real life when, when you have those same inevitable, intense, uncomfortable situations. Um, and you start to feel those same signals of anxiety and stress bubbling up, you now have practice, you know, uh, uh, staying calm in the face of those um, by playing the game. So if that makes any sense, it's, it's a little bit hard to explain, you know, but um, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, basically it's, it's um, uh, yeah, as I said, it's like a stress management tool disguised as a, as a video game or just a fun video game if you don't, you know, you're not interested in stress management stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the thing that is most the most telling, because um, you had Markiplier play the game, right? Or Markiplier played yeah, it? Yeah, he played he played the original uh, student version, the thesis version of it, um, way back in the day, um, which was just the coolest thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, I remember I remember watching that stream and just having him be like affected by the fact that like stuff was like reacting to him or like he was just getting ultra scared about everything. And that's a one of the most interesting things about the game is the fact that like or the one of the things that's most creepy about the game is that the game notices when you're uncomfortable, yeah. <laughs> which is yep. uncomfortable in itself. And 
the fact that you have to like the the trick is is that you actually have to calm yourself down for it to like go away is um again talking about uh video games being a safe space to experience those things um but at the same time it's still triggering a trauma response that can be very, very intense and so um it's it's interesting to draw that line between immersion therapy of like i'm going to get myself close to something that makes me uncomfortable and i don't like but it's also going to help me control my anxiety and maybe if i have a phobia attached to it too that i can work through that so um that's it those are the two things that i thought was really awesome and because you had like you talk to uh, psychologists and stuff like that obviously you're not a psychologist yourself but you different definitely talk to um many ex experts in making the game right yeah exactly and it was really important to us to make sure that we um were as informed as we could be in, in making the game both in terms of um making sure we were approaching the narrative um in a very respectful and authentic way um in terms of telling stories of trauma and um, and PTSD and CPTSD, you know, um, because sort of a, another goal of the game for us was to also bring awareness to PTSD and, and psychological trauma, because it's something that um, I think a lot of people are aware of um, to some extent, but um, uh, there's so much about it that, that um, I think a lot of folks don't know and don't understand. You know, for example, a lot of people think of PTSD, they think of soldiers coming home from war and um, maybe, uh, you know, uh, uh, like refugees, you know, there's, and those are certainly lots of cases of PTSD there. But what I think is, what, it, what I've found, you know, and, and speaking with a lot of people is, is that, you know, trauma and psychological trauma is so common, you know, and so many people are wrestling with it. And I think there's a lack of understanding that this is something that, you know, you, you don't have to have been um, to war uh, to, to be, working through PTSD and trauma, you know, trauma can come from anywhere and it can affect anyone. Um, and so we really wanted to shine a light on that. And so, you know, it was important to us to make sure that we were, were doing that in a very respectful and, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, responsible way. Um, and then of course, you know, we wanted to make sure that the whole biofeedback element was informed as well, because, you know, there, there, Especially when we first started making Nevermind, there, there weren't a whole lot of biofeedback games to use as reference. So we we're kind of trying to figure <laughs> it out as we go along. And again, like as you said, like I'm not a psychologist. Um, you know, I'm just a, a, a you know a game maker and who has this this idea and, and this vision. And so um, you know, we wanted to make sure that we were getting the information we needed to do this right and, and correctly. So um, yeah, I talked to a lot of people throughout the whole process of, of making the game. Cool. Um, and with every game, uh, especially if you're part of a very small team, because uh, the full, when you're making the full version of Nevermind, like how many employees did you have? Like six or 10? I think, no, I think at our, our biggest full time, we had five. Five? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a very small team. And we had a few <laughs> other people kind of helping out, you know, and, and as needed as well. So it wasn't like, only five people working on it, but um, sure. yeah, yeah, very small team. So, um, and when you have a small team, you tend to put a lot of yourself in the game, uh, both literally and figuratively. But uh, I want to walk that back a little bit, and I want to ask you a general question, which is: Never mind, is a horror game that trains players to fight their fears and phobias in real life. So, Aaron Reynolds, what are some of your phobias? Oh my gosh! Uh, <laughs> so, uh, phobias, huh? So I have a I have a common one, um, like spiders. I just do not like spiders. Um, uh, I have a less common one. I do not like large human statues. Uh, <laughs> and um, so, yeah, those are those are my two my two phobias. So the spider ones make sense, but where does where does the uh, human statue one stem from? I have a few suspicions. Uh, and like they're they're one of those things where like it's like I feel like explaining where a phobia came from is like explaining a dream to someone where like to yourself it's a big deal and then like the other people are like oh, yeah and um, but uh, you know I think I think as a as a kid I had an experience where uh, I was I wandered off by myself and and found myself lost in a room with a giant like scary statue like looking at me and that just like 
I think just ruined large human statues for me for the rest of, of my life. So, yeah. uh, was that, was that in Singapore? That was in Singapore, right? That was, that moment was in Vietnam. Yeah. Oh, in Vietnam. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you, so. you grew up in Singapore, right? Partially. Yeah. Yeah. I moved around a lot growing up. So I spent uh, a few years in Singapore um, and a little bit of time in Vietnam as well, which was awesome. Uh, I feel very grateful for, for having that life experience as, as a, uh, um, kind of growing up and getting to see those parts of the world. Um, both both are amazing countries, and I highly encourage anyone and everyone to visit them uh, when it's safe, you know, pandemic and all of that. And there's no scary giant sketch statues around. Yeah, and you know, uh, and giant spiders. Also, my fear of, of giant spiders came from there too. Um, <laughs> I do I do have a good story with that one. That's much better than than my giant statue story. Um, for the spiders. So in Singapore, the house that we lived in was, uh, you know, was, was open air. And this was common for a lot of houses there because it's just, it's so hot all the time that it's not really economical to air condition a house. Um, and so, and, and you know, we get these rainfalls, you know, like every afternoon. So it, it cools down. And so what you, you have are these giant um, like windows, but they're not glassed in and just open. And so the air can kind of come in and get circulation and that keeps everything pretty comfortable. Um, the, the only problem with that though, is that, you know, Singapore is basically a, a rainforest. And so when you have giant, large, you know, holes in your wall, the rainforest can come inside the house, you know, no problem at all. And, and most of the time that was kind of cool. Like you'd have geckos and butterflies. And, um, I remember we'd have giant like fruit bats sleeping, uh, on the ceiling of our bedroom, which was super awesome. Um, you know, so it felt very, uh, um, cool more often than not, but, there was one morning when um, uh, I came downstairs for breakfast and this was when I was like, I'm completely blind now, but back then I was only somewhat nearsighted so I could get around with not wearing my glasses and walk around. And so I didn't have my glasses on. Um, and my mom was like, Hey, Aaron, check out, check out what's on the wall. Like this, this, you know, cool thing. And I'm like, okay. And I'm walking up to it and I'm nearsighted. So I can't really bring it into focus until I get closer, a little bit closer a little bit closer. I think, oh, is it like a, is it a butterfly? Like, is it a big, you know? And like, just the moment when it like comes into focus as like a giant, like tarantula thing, it jumps at me. And I don't remember anything for like the next few minutes. I just remember like blacking out and then waking up crying in a corner. <laughs> and, so, and so, yeah, after that, do not like spiders all that much. So you, you saw the, uh, the from software, you died screen and then you restarted your game. <laughs> Pretty much, pretty much. So, yep. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so going back, going back to Nevermind, um, it was a, you know, it was, it was an experience that I'm sure taught you a bunch of lessons, uh, found in indie studio by yourself and running a game to completion and, you know, doing all the dog and pony show that it is of, trying to sell a game, trying to ship a game is not an easy task. And I commend you for that. Um, but what are some of the biggest lessons that you learned from the experience of founding a company and having Nevermind ship? Yeah. Um, gosh, some of the biggest lessons. I mean, I, obviously I learned a lot. Um, you know, I think, uh, so it's kind of hard to distill it into just, just a few, but, um, well, I mean, you can expand on different, you, you can expand on it any way you want to. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, it, yeah. it doesn't have to be an elevator pitch. Sure, of course, of course. I, um, I mean, I think you know, one thing that I learned um, is that you know, if, if you really, I think I learned in reinforced because I think I kind of knew this already, but it was really like a powerful way of like proving it out to me, I guess. Um, is if you really feel something like in your gut that you really like just have to do and it doesn't doesn't really like make sense on paper. Um, like for example, like leaving this job that I loved at Zynga uh, to go start a company, even though like I honestly had no desire at all to start a company in and of itself. I just I just had this sense that would like not ever not go away that I needed to continue never mind. And and so starting a company was part of that. And so like, I mean, I have a, I have an art background, you know, like what am I doing starting a business? 
but you know, you just kind of go with it and follow it and, and everything kind of sort of falls into place as you go along. So, you know, I was very lucky that I knew people um, who could teach me the things I didn't know about running a business. Um, and, uh, you know, where am I going to find the money to, to make a game? Because games are incredibly expensive to make. Um, and just kind of, you know, just taking it one day at a time and putting lots of different options and like maybe this crowdfunding thing that will work and, and just little by little, yeah, all the pieces just would fall into place, even though on paper, it just didn't make sense. Like this should not have worked, you know, to make a biofeedback <laughs> thriller game, you know, to, to, you know, release on, you know, Steam and, and Xbox and, and, and all that, like, it just shouldn't have worked but you know if you really feel strongly about something then you know you just keep going for it and and eventually like everything will will come together you know even when like you know for example um our our first major kickstarter campaign that we ran um ended up failing even though you know it it's it brought in a lot of attention. We just didn't hit the Kickstarter goal. Um, and so, you know, with Kickstarter, it's all or nothing. So that didn't work out. And so, you know, we ended the, the campaign thinking like, uh, okay, now, now what? <laughs> you know, how are we going to fund this game? Right. And, um, you know, a few weeks after that, I get this email from someone at Intel saying, hey, we found out about Nevermind through the Kickstarter campaign. I'm working on this technology that, um, picks up heart rate through through a camera, um, and we're looking for for games that might support it. Is this something that you might be interested in? You know, we can help with development funding if if if, if you'd like. It's like so. You want me to integrate like what sounds like the coolest technology ever, and you're going to help from the development? <laughs> yeah, I think that sounds that sounds like that could that could work well. You know, and so just things kind of fall into place. You know, and and so. Um, and, and like again and again, even when it looks like all hope was lost, you know, if you just keep going just a little bit, you know, it, 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 it works out. So, um, you know, I, I know that feels very, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know. It's, you know. <laughs> it, it sounds very like you know, motivational postery, maybe, but um, hang in there. Yeah, exactly. And like, I don't want to sound like that, but, but, but it is something that like over and over again kept reinforcing itself for me. So, um, so that was, I think something kind of cool. Yeah. I mean, um, even if things don't work out the way you want them to, or, you know, expectations or sales aren't met, it doesn't matter because you're richer for the experience of going through it. And yeah. it's hard to quantify the growth, um, that you might've had mm -hmm. during that whole experience. But like, I can tell you that, that you've grown as a person, um, and I'm sure, you, I'm sure you feel more confident and able in your game making ways, having gone through that experience. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, I, I feel more confident knowing that, uh, one, if I don't know how to do something, but I'm interested in it, I'll, I'll learn, you know, if I can, if, if this super crazy shy art student can learn how to run a business and do a crowdfunding <laughs> campaign and, and all that, then then, you know, I can do almost anything, um, you know, and, uh, uh, and also, yeah, just like, you know, just trust in my gut more, you know, so uh, that's, those are very, again, like, maybe they don't sound like big deals, but they were to me, so, um, yeah. We're all a big deal, Aaron, we're all a big deal. <laughs> um, speaking of a big deal, uh, I mentioned in the intro that you're working for the House of Mouse, a.k.a. Disney. Uh, but you can't really talk about anything that you're doing. So I'm going to play a fun game, which is uh, in the most vaguest of ways possible. How is this new role challenging you? Oh, gosh. Uh, I would say that it is very different from anything that I've done um, in my career, which is great because I'm learning a ton every day um, and I'm working with some really cool people um, love what I'm doing. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's very different, um, which is always challenging in a sense, but, but it's incredibly rewarding and fun. And yeah, again, like I'm learning so much uh, that it's, it's, it's very cool. And that's all we can talk about. That's all I can say. <laughs> that's all I can say. 
GG. Thanks, Disney. <laughs> Kevin Feige is gonna gonna sack me for trying to get Aaron to say anything. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, let's walk away from that and talk about other things we can talk about, um, which is uh, so being a very, very much an active member of the games community. Um, you're a co-chair for Indicade, um, and you're also a frequent speaker in slash volunteer for GDC, the Game Developers Conference. Um, so uh, I guess what do those two events and or organizations mean to you personally? Yeah, I mean, um, gosh. I guess with with Indicate, you know, Indie, Indicate is is something that's always been near and dear to my heart ever since um, I first found out about it. You know, I think the there's just so much creativity um, and and just great people and, and cool ideas happening in, in the indie community. And um, Indicate is is this place where, like when it was in person, it was great because you know you could get the indie community together as much as many people at least who could make it out there and you'd run into like so many old friends it was like a, a giant reunion and then you'd make so many new friends as well you know and, and just the conversations you would have about what everyone's working on and, and supporting each other is so supportive you know i think uh, one thing that's great by and large with the indie community is that everybody knows how hard it is and so you know it's very supportive in that like people are willing to help and share knowledge and um, make connections and introductions where they can, you know, and so it's just this really, just a really wholesome, great place to be a part of and then this very really energizing, you know, um, experience. Um, and, you know, since it's moved online, it's a little bit of a different vibe. There's still this, this, this knowledge sharing and getting to see and celebrate each other's games and be inspired by what other people are working on. And, and what's been really cool about it moving online is that now more people internationally can be a part of it too. So you're getting to see all this amazing content that's being made from the other other side of the world, you know. Um, you know, and and as of late, you know, I've, I've been especially inspired by the types of games that are coming out of countries outside of the U.S. You know, I think there's, I mean, there's lots of great stuff happening in the U.S. too. But but still, yeah. like it's it's game making now has become so uh, global and accessible, and, and that that it's just so many great, uh, you know interactive experiences and, and storytelling that, that we're, get, we're finding out about and getting to play. So I think that's really cool. Um, and Indicate is just, again, just this amazing community. Um, uh, and then GDC as well, you know, I have a real, uh, I have a lot of gratitude for, for the Game Developers Conference, especially the Conference Associate Program, which is the volunteer, um, uh, you know, uh, behind the scenes uh, folks, you know, um, at, the, at the conference where uh, I, started as a, a, a actually my first GDC I went as an IGDA scholar which again a lot of gratitude a great program highly recommend it if you're looking to get in the game industry definitely check it out um, and then also check out the GDC conference associate program as well that was my second GDC and I think I've been volunteering almost every year for almost over, over 10 years uh, so for a while yeah. <laughs> and I've uh, made so many great friends through the program, learned so much. Again, it's just this really wonderful supportive community and you get to learn so much behind the scenes of, of the conference, you know, and, and see how it's all run and get to meet a lot of people. It's 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 one of those things, again, it's kind of hard to explain. You kind of just have to be there, but again, I can't recommend it highly enough. So um, it's been a real privilege to be able to be a part of the GDC in that capacity. Um, for so many years, and as well as speak as well, you know, kind of be on the other side of things too. It's it's uh, great to to kind of you know enjoy the game making community from all these different angles and getting to meet the different people who are involved in all the different areas where you're speaking or volunteering or you know yeah all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Um, so you kind of touched on this already, um, kind of denoting the fact that. Games have really games and game making has really made it uh, to a global stage. Um, I definitely feel that uh, because of the pandemic. Um, I've worked at a company for going on two years now, and I've never stepped foot in the physical office. Uh, I have coworkers that have been on the other side of the country, or I have coworkers that are in different time zones, and we still make it work. Um, so it's interesting to live in the literally the 2020s era of game making because. Your coworkers might live on the other side of the company, but you're all towards working towards a shared goal of making awesome games. Um, so, with with having a finger to the pulse of 
not only indie games but also just you know through gdc seeing the future futures of games in general um of all the awesome things that people are making um what are you most excited about in terms of like where games are headed or where like the terms of future of, of games are headed and I, i'm asking that because you're you're not mark zuckerberg <laughs> Not yet, anyway. And, yeah. and I would very much like an opinion from somebody that's not Mark Zuckerberg about where games and the future of, of all games are headed. <laughs> yeah, that's a hard question because, I mean, when the game industry is so, uh, it just changes so much in, in so many unexpected ways. And then, of course, you know, in this this pandemic era, just the world at large is changing so much in so many unexpected ways that I... I really, I've given up on trying to predict <laughs> because you know, it's there's there's it's just it's so hard, you know. And, and I think um, to, to, it's so hard to like look like you know one year ahead. Never mind five years ahead. Never mind ten years ahead. You know, um, because there's just so many variables at play, um, many of which we don't even know yet. Um, I feel you know, but uh, I I am very excited about more people from around the world being able to make games. I think that's huge. And that's something that, that I don't think will change even when things go back to, you know, normal, whatever normal will end up being. Um, so that, that has me very encouraged and, and, and I'm hoping that it means that we'll have even more um, diverse stories being told um, through games um, and experiences being created through games. Um, I think the funding model for indie games um, you know, where a lot of these sort of these stories are being told, um, will need to evolve from what it's been traditionally, because um, again, just the world is changing and, and the needs are changing and, and game expectations are changing. Um, so that's something that I, I think will happen um, eventually. Um, now what, what that change will be, what the funding model will look like, I don't know, but um, you know, I think, you know, funding models for games are always changing anyway, you know. I, uh, I remember there was a GDC where, many years ago, um, where they announced a major game was going to have microtransactions, you know, in it, like <laughs> in-game purchases, and everyone was just like, what? No. Like, it was just like, oh, this is the worst, like, you know. And, and so, of course, you know, here we are, where it's like, that's just normal, you know. So, yeah, yeah. it's, it's uh, the, the nature of of game development funding and game monetization, all that, like, who knows, but, um, you know, and, and I do think that, like, I don't, I don't want to get into the whole, like, metaverse conversation, but. Oh, I, think, I, I wasn't trying to take a serious, yeah. it was just more of, like, just having a perspective of, like, where do you see the games industry going, or, like, what are some of the most interesting things that you've seen in recent years that have come out of, like, either Indicator, GDC, or just uh, game makers in general that has caught your interest? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was just going to say that I think it's it's been very interesting to see how people have used games to connect to each other, you know, during the pandemic as well. I think that's really interesting and, and um, something that games is a way to bring us together. Is, 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 is Games have always been a way to bring us together, but I think that growing is something that um, will continue. I hope it, it does. Um, you know, I mean, personally, I and look, I'm biased because of Nevermind and all that, but I do think that biofeedback in games is going to be something that's going to become uh, less of a niche, you know, experimental thing. Um, eventually, I thought it was going to happen sooner than I think, when I was making Nevermind, I thought it was going to happen sooner than, than I now think it's going to happen. Sure. Um, you know, but but to me, it seems like such a, 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 a natural fit, um, you know, because like so many of us like have an Apple Watch or a Fitbit or some kind of connected device that is getting the biometric data anyway. Um, and, and to have a game that, you know, I mean, the way Nevermind does it is very on the nose. You know, it's a horror game. And as you get more scared, it gets more spooky. You know, like right. that's that's very like, um, that, that's one approach. But I think there's more subtle ways to do it. Like um, I know Valve has done a lot of um, uh, experimentation with um, using biometrics to determine um, dynamic difficulty um, as you're playing. So as you're playing a game, the, as, as the game picks up, um, you know, increased frustration, it becomes a little easier. And then as it picks up uh, boredom, and I'm drastically oversimplifying this, but you know, it is, it picks up boredom, it'll get more difficult so that you stay as a player in the flow state, which is generally what you want as a game designer. And they found that it indeed made the game more engaging. I mean, to me, it seems like 
any game can benefit from that. You know, if you have technology that helps your game adapt dynamically to each individual player to be the most interesting experience for them, why not use that? Um, you know, and then of course you, you can think of like using biofeedback for metrics too, in order to, you know, get uh, aggregate data um, of how people are responding in general so that you're not guessing why, you know, players are churning at level five. You know, you have a little bit more insight into that and you can tune the game to be, to be better. Like to me, that seems very obvious and very natural. And so I think it's inevitable that that's something that we'll see more of at some point. I just don't know, you know, when that might be. Yeah. I mean, it's important to note that one of the biggest mobile games of the last 10 years to Pokemon Go, uh, you could cash it up, geocache it up to being a geocaching game in disguise. But uh, the fact that you actually have to like equip eggs and then walk to hatch them means that it's using biometric data to actually um, reinforce gameplay loops, which I think is really fascinating. So um, there's more than one way to incorporate that technology into games. And so um, it's just whether or not more companies decide to use it. But I think Pokemon Go is probably the most successful version of incorporating biometrics into, into games for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and going back to the pandemic, uh, I just realized that you and I <laughs> got the last regular weekend in Los Angeles yes. <laughs> pre-pandemic together, oh my gosh. which is which is a little surreal uh, to think about it. And the fact is, I, I realized I hadn't I haven't seen you since March seventh, which I uh, twenty twenty, <laughs> oh <my laughs> which is literally my birthday. <laughs> oh, it was tragic. either March seventh or March March seventh or March ninth. I think it was March ninth, but it was like the last weekend of the n last normal weekend in Los Angeles, and yeah. uh, it's so surreal to know that like I we got like the last normal weekend of like the normal times air quotes whatever that means anymore. Well, if so. there's any way to, to say farewell to normal times, I couldn't think of a better way than, than getting to hang out with, with you. And so that was that was a, a good way to, to <laughs> you know, get all the fun yeah. in before the, the long winter of the pandemic. <laughs> to say goodbye to any sense of normalcy. Oh, oh God. Yeah. <sighs> All right. Well, since I've gone into the realm of loaded questions or loaded statements, uh, I want to ask one more loaded question or loaded statement um, because I think it's important as a game maker because you met, you and I both have mentored high school kids um, on game design specifically. Uh, that's another thing we could probably get, in, get into in another podcast unless you want to talk about it super quickly. But actually, let's just talk about it. Can you explain what you did at Zynga um, in terms of like kicking off the, the game design program? Yeah, well, I, I think you're giving me a little too much credit for it, but but uh, yeah. Well, you start you started it. I continued it, and then it you know it went on with other people as well. So, but yeah, it, you know it was it was great. I mean, in in Zynga.org also, you know, was a was a, a big part of it. Where um, you know Zynga is, is in general was really all about kind of giving back to the community, and and so you know um, Zynga.org and and I and then you. I mean, you were involved from the early days as well. You know, kind of thought like, okay, we have all these great schools local, locally, you know, in San Francisco. How can we give back to those? And, and maybe we can have sort of a program where we teach high schoolers generally like how one goes about thinking about making games to get them interested in thinking about game as a game design as a career, you know, so that they don't go through college and become a 3D animator and visual effects artist before they realize that making games is actually a career you can have. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you know, we 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 put together a um, uh, you know, a, a workshop, a fun workshop, uh, and it was just over the course of a afternoon, really. You know, where we we introduced uh, the students to different aspects of thinking about games, and game development, and game design, and got them to prototype a game and and get feedback and present it, and, and it was just it was just so much fun. You know, it was just so joyful, and and for me. You know, it was it was so rewarding because it it really highlighted to me the the joy of what we do and why we do what we do. You know, and, and that making games is, is such a it's a lot of work. It's so much work, but it's also <laughs> it's also a real privilege to be able to to do do that. You know, and to to make games and and to, you know it's something that we should be having fun while doing. And, and so that workshop and and bringing that to to students and. and Kind of showing them a little bit of how the sausage is made was was just really uh, trying to hold a light on that. It was such a inspiring 
afternoon for me at least, you know, and so it was really, um, I, I got a lot out of it. I, I don't know if, I don't know if they did, but <laughs> I certainly did. <laughs> well, so, yeah, I did, yeah. I did too. Um, I think the most interesting thing about that whole experience is, um, obviously all the interaction with the, with the students was, were, was fantastic. Um, and I'm glad that I had time to mentor them, albeit a, you know, a short time. Um, but uh, there's a real surreal moment because like during a kickoff meeting, we were in a, uh, a meeting with the superintendent of San Francisco and um, he kind of got off on a little bit of a tangent about like how parents, you know, are a little bit iffy about reinforcing video games in a, in a um, educational uh, environment. And mm -hmm. so I decided to rise up from the ashes and be like, hey, buddy. <laughs> I was told my entire life that game video games were a waste of my time and that I would never amount to nothing by playing them. And now I'm in the industry. And if you had told me that I could be in the games industry and make games, my head would have exploded um, because I just like you, I didn't have any idea that like this could actually be a career and I didn't understand like how, what the steps were or anything like that. Like I really similar to you, I stumbled my way into it of like, Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go work for Electronic Arts, and then suddenly I'm in QA, and then I worked all my way up to become a game designer. Um, yeah, it's the earlier you arm kids with knowledge, you know, the the more they're set up for success. And um, kids these days don't know how how easy they have it compared to us when we were in the '80s and '90s. <laughs> it's true. I mean, like, what's so cool is that that you know, kids can actually make you know real ass games. You know, you. Know, whatever they want you know with with tools like unity and unreal and all of that you know they, they can and, and what an amazing creative outlet to to have that you know like gosh i i had rpg maker when i was in high school i did the best i could with that you know but to i i think i think the beauty of teaching uh you know young younger students you know uh about games as a career is that it really also provides context for a lot of what they're learning in school too, you know, because game development, when, one of the things that I love most about it is it's such a multidisciplinary um, collaborative effort, you know? And so, you know, I, like if I had learned that, you know, math would be needed for programming, I probably would have been so much more interested in math than, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like it's like these lame word problems. It's like, I'm never gonna use this. But if someone said, look, no, you are going to use it because, you know, if you want to make games, you need to learn how to use algorithms and and, and, and know math to, to make things work. Then it's like, oh, oh, now I understand, like, why this is important. And now I'm motivated to learn it. And, you know, and same with, you know, art or, or writing or any of those disciplines. I think it really, you know, obviously not everyone's going to want to grow up to be a game maker, but for those who do, um, or those who are always curious about it, it it's it's such a a cool way to frame everything else that they're learning and a cool creative a good outlet that they can use. You know, maybe they don't paint, but maybe they can express themselves through games. Like how cool is that? So I think uh, it, it is very encouraging to see that games are being, game development is being more accepted as a, well, what a career pursuit, you know? Um, Cause like when I, you know, went to, to college originally, there weren't really any game programs out there. Like game design programs just, did not even exist, you know, and right. now so many universities offer it in some capacity. And so that's amazing. And now a lot of high schools are teaching it and there's a Girl Scout badge for it, which I'm so jealous about, but- Oh, I didn't know uh, that, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I am so jealous, but also so excited about that, you know? And so I think um, that, that gives me a lot of hope for the future, both in, in, in you know, game development and in kind of the, the world at large. You know. Um, so to that end, uh, Aaron, if you could turn back time, like share, blessed be your name, uh, <laughs> what advice would current Aaron give to college Aaron or younger Aaron? Oh gosh, I would give the advice that it's okay to be who you are. You know, I think, um, in college and you know, for, for a long time, I was very much not comfortable in my own skin, you know, I was getting very shy, um, never really fit in, you know, I moved around a lot growing up. So I never really had like a home base, you know, and, and so I was very um, self conscious and, uh, and I thought there was something wrong with me, you know, and then 
now I realize it's just, you know what, like everyone, you know, everyone feels weird and out of place, you know, to some extent, everyone has imposter syndrome to some extent, you know, so if I could go back in time, I would tell my younger self, like, it's cool to feel that way. That's fine. But you're okay. You're going to be okay. Um, just be your, yourself, your, your weird, nerdy self. That's, that's going to be your, your main asset, you know, later on. So just roll with it. Um, yeah. And then I probably would have freaked out because younger me would be like, what? Who are you? And, and <laughs> why are you we'll talking to me? Go away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So. Um, do you know what I would tell younger Aaron? What would you tell younger Aaron? I would say uh -oh. surprise. <gasps> Oh my so gosh. Aaron used to torture me. This is her Rickroll. She would send me Pickle Surprise and I would click on link. Like it would be work links and suddenly Pickle Surprise would show up. See, because I... Go ahead. It's a surprise, Aaron. Don't interrupt. <laughs> I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> I genuinely love that, that movie so much. Like it just, it's just, uh, I just love it there's just something like a genuine joy <laughs> I'm, you're I'm a sick so and sadistic sorry, person i hate you so, so much I no <laughs> that's my phobia aaron and it's all your fault <laughs> i'm scared of the pickle man oh need to play more never mind <laughs> no thank you i'm good okay. all right aaron um it's been so much fun to talk to you uh hey, would guys. you like to plug anything before we take off Oh gosh, uh, not, I don't have anything to plug. What should I plug, Nick? Is there anything that that you would like for me to plug? Well, I mean, you talked highly of Indicade. Do you want to plug Indicade, perhaps? Do you want sure. to plug Nevermind on Steam? Any of those things? <laughs> I guess I could. So yes, Indicade is great. Please check it out. It's it's a wonderful um, community. If you are a game maker and you're working on an indie game, they're taking submissions now. Um, so definitely submit. Um, and you can learn more on NDK.com. Um, if you're interested in playing Nevermind, you can find it on Steam. You can also learn more about the game and the technology we support, like Apple Watch and, and even a webcam uh, solution. Go to nevermindgame.com. Um, and, uh, and keep listening to this awesome podcast because Nick knows a lot of cool people and interviews a lot of cool people. And uh, um, yeah, it's a... It's, uh, a worthy podcast to listen to. Don't don't pander to the audience. They're they're captive audience already. <laughs> I know. I'll just keep coming um, back. Just yeah. Don't let me scare you away. There's other interviews as well. <laughs> don't yourself short, madam. Um, are you giving are you are you giving a GDC talk this year as well? Or, I'm going to be on the panel year? this year. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm actually still learning details about it. So um, but yes, I guess uh, Google a GDC. Stay talk. Stay tuned. Yeah. Stay tuned and. Uh, We'll find it so and then if you if you want to if i'm sure i'll be uh, promoting it on the socials so you can find me on twitter at at reynolds phobia uh if you have a phobia of reynolds is that is where you go so um i'll uh, share more information there as it becomes available <laughs> awesome all right aaron well thank you so much for your time it's been fantastic to talk to you likewise as always good to see you nick good to talk to you and uh stay stay safe out there I will try. Um, everybody else, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And we'll catch you next time.